Founded in 1999 by former Rare developers who served as creative forces on GoldenEye 007 and Perfect Dark, developer Free Radical Design built what many consider among the most inventive first-person shooters of the 2000s. The Time Splitters series especially set the world on fire with exciting time travel elements. Free Radical's subsequent project, Second Sight, brought its own unique brand of thrilling gameplay to the table as well, courtesy of various psychic mechanics. The Nottingham-based group tried pushing the envelope further when designing Haze, a PlayStation 3 exclusive primarily remembered for playing a role in the studio's collapse. Haze didn't bear the look of an ill-fated project in the years leading up to its May 2008 release. On the contrary, Free Radical and publisher Ubisoft never seemed anything less than proud of the first-person shooter's progress. And apart from minor technical concerns months before launch, previews and other public showings were met with predominantly positive reception. Free Radical possessed the right ingredients. A world-renowned development team known for producing seminal experiences, the backing of a major publisher, and a gameplay hook that married well with an intriguing futuristic plot. Unfortunately, technical shortcomings and other circumstances beyond the developer's control greatly hindered their ability to deliver the final product as promised. Players instead found themselves navigating a stale experience that failed to uphold the standards established across Free Radical's otherwise stellar pedigree. At its core, then, Hayes constituted the result of a talented team doing its best with the inferior hand it was dealt. This is the tragedy of Hayes. This video has been brought to you in part by Dying Light. Dying Light is a survival horror game by Techland that combines zombie slaying action with free running and parkour to spectacular effect. Featuring a meticulously designed open world with a unique day and night cycle as its sandbox, players are able to bash, mash, and trash zombies like never before during daytime hours. While the night turns the undead more aggressive and sees the hunter become the hunted. Keen on improving your odds when this happens? Dying Light features up to four-player co-op, so you'll never have to face the zombie menace alone. With its sequel almost on store shelves, there's never been a better time to get into the world of Dying Light. To celebrate the game's 30th anniversary, there'll be a 70% discount on Steam from the 9th until the 21st of December. In addition, everyone who uses our personal code will receive a free rare in-game item. Follow the link in the description to find out more. We'd like to thank Techland for sponsoring this video, and we hope you will have a fun time slaying, parkouring, and kicking zombies from skyscrapers in Dying Light. Free Radical Design enjoyed a healthy first few years of operation. Its ownership of the Time Splitters IP meant publisher Eidos Interactive employed a relatively hands off approach in terms of its role as an overseer. Such a balanced partnership between developer and publisher couldn't last in perpetuity, though, specifically due to rising development costs. Thus, in the midst of a turbulent relationship with Electronic Arts for 2005's Time Splitter's Future Perfect, free radical developers noticed a shift in the industry. The advent of the seventh console generation saw production budgets skyrocket, culminating in publishers adopting conservative business models that favored internal teams and IP that could easily move millions of units. Based on what co-founder David Doak told Eurogamer, these changes affected Free Radical on a molecular level. Most notably, publishers wanted projects comprised of a serious military tone that supplanted the studio's trademark cartoony style since games of the latter variety often struggled to gain a foothold on the market. Free Radical's insistence on holding IP rights didn't sit well with the newfangled realities of the industry either. Upon aligning itself with French publisher Ubisoft for Hayes, the independent group had no choice but to sign a co-ownership deal, an agreement that quickly illustrated the disadvantages of developers not fully owning their properties. The Time Splitters team approached telling a war story in games from an Apocalypse Now-inspired, anti-militaristic bent that garnered approval from Ubisoft. Yet while it seemed Free Radical more or less received carte blanche to explore a complex narrative about the horrors of war, Ubisoft added stipulations that creatively shackled the developers from the start. Supposedly, the publisher wanted Hayes to target a teen rating. If true, a change of heart must have taken place, given the game's mature rating at release. Regardless, interference from Ubisoft wouldn't begin to drastically have adverse effects on Hayes' production until later in the development cycle. 
According to Steve Ellis, another of Free Radical's founding members, the start of the shooter's myriad developmental woes emerged when the team replaced its existing graphics engine by building a new one from the ground up. Ellis remarked in a GamesIndustry.biz interview that Free Radical's original C-based engine had grown antiquated. Rather than update the existing technology, programmers wanted to start from scratch by crafting a C++ game engine. Yet, what seemed a good idea from the outset inevitably led to delays because Hayes and the engine of the same name were created concurrently. Free Radical staffers consequently started development on incomplete technology, which spent a lengthy period of time in a state of limbo. Technical difficulties spanned far and wide, even impacting the Conspire AI system. Hayes' ambitious attempt at revolutionizing unscripted enemy AI encounters across the story campaign and online modes. Engine troubles engendered the group's inability to meet milestones, causing several delays that, in turn, soured the relationship between Free Radical and Ubisoft. Though the publisher always granted Free Radical's delay requests when the need arose, creative director Derek Littlewood later divulged Ubisoft's mandate on building new content, which effectively detracted from time spent fixing known issues. This level of non-productivity also manifested in the French company's disinterest in cutting and refining subpar features, as the quantity of content took precedent over quality. Steve Ellis corroborated as much himself, explaining that Free Radical lost its ability to decline Ubisoft's instructions as the internal delays piled up. In discussing the matter with Engadget, Ellis posited the publisher had begun to perceive Free Radical as incompetent, evidenced by the inexperienced producers assigned to govern Hayes' direction partway through production. These people were given license to dictate nearly every facet of the first-person shooter's forward momentum. Reportedly, the Ubisoft-appointed producers even wielded the power to withhold payments in the event that Free Radical disagreed with their assessments. The constant interference resulted in a product that simultaneously felt overproduced and unpolished. To the chagrin of many a developer, a couple of late-stage marketing decisions further exacerbated the situation surrounding the already embattled haze. Initially teased in November 2005 as a mature-themed action title for PC, PS3, and Xbox 360, Hayes formally entered the public eye with a cinematic trailer during E3 2006. The teaser depicted generic-looking soldiers, along with stock environments that befit military shooters of the era. Hayes' premise sounded similarly trite in some respects. In a story set in the not-too-distant future, players would assume the role of Shane Carpenter of Mantle Corp a far-reaching global conglomerate billing itself as a peacekeeping organization while specializing in fanciful armaments and biomedical enhancements. A behind-closed-doors demo for press also revealed D-pad-controlled squad commands centered around group tactics. The one unique angle hinged on an anti-military theme, which promised to eschew the trends of war games by telling a morality-driven story capable of challenging players to consider new perspectives. Hayes vanished for a time after its E3 debut, resurfacing in May 2007 with a host of changes in tow, all seemingly for the better. Gone were the generic soldiers and their uninspired military garb, replaced by combatants donning black and yellow B-themed attire. Free Radical similarly abandoned squad controls, as such Hayes's previously unseen Nectar Serum took center stage during the renewed marketing blowout. A combat enhancement drug supplying mantle troopers with special abilities, Nectar rested at the core of the first-person shooter's narrative and gameplay mechanics. David Doak touted the substance as the tool that gave Hayes an edge in redefining the possibilities of FPS titles. Notably, it represented a blessing and a curse, greatly affecting how soldiers perceive the world around them, and the player-controlled nature of the serum allowed for overdosing. Negative effects that proved detrimental on the battlefield, with players and team AI alike unable to discern friend from foe. Mantle's enemies, a faction of South American rebels named Promise Hand, could exploit the gaseous drug too, weaponizing it with nectar grenades and by shooting out the troopers' personal nectar tanks to cause an overdose. Interestingly, Free Radical's public teases concerning the conflict between Mantle and Promise Hand were hinting at a deeper narrative about the nuances of warfare, something players would explore on both sides of the aisle. Disenchanted by Mantle's manipulation of its troops through Nectar, protagonist Shane Carpenter would defect to the Rebels partway through the campaign, forcing players to transition from wielding enhanced battle senses to utilizing relatively common weaponry. 
and little else. It was a bold choice, narratively and gameplay-wise, but it was a choice the creators intended users to discover upon playing Hayes for the first time. Presumably, due to the difficulties involved in selling Hayes to general audiences, marketing spoiled the plot twist ahead of release, robbing would-be fans of a pivotal story moment. Years after the shooter's launch, Littlewood pondered how discourse around the title may have shifted if promotional concerns hadn't superseded artistic integrity. Another unwise marketing decision proved far more detrimental to the project's potential, though. Games media had no qualms about dubbing Hayes a Halo killer. Despite its desire to redefine first-person shooters, Free Radical never internally viewed the new IP in such a light. But Sony's E3 2007 announcement of Hayes as a timed PlayStation 3 exclusive permanently affixed the competitive moniker to the short-lived franchise. Speaking with IGN at that E3, Ubisoft's then-VP of Marketing, Tony Key, called the exclusivity deal a natural fit considering Free Radical's history on PlayStation consoles with time splitters. Studio co-founder David Doak chimed in as well, referring to the platform as the crew's spiritual home before touting PlayStation 3's raw processing power as a technological advantage. The behind-the-scenes reality of the agreement was far from cheery, however. A candid discussion between Eurogamer and Hayes' project manager Martin Wakeley revealed that Ubisoft signed the deal with Sony late in development in exchange for added marketing benefits. Under different circumstances, the shift in focus to one specific device may have represented a boon for development, but not in this instance. According to Wakeley, Hayes never really ran on PS3. Free Radical co-founder Carl Hilton shared similar sentiments in a 2009 Develop interview explaining that while PS3 boasted powerful inner workings, its cell processor made unlocking the system's full potential rather difficult. As a result, the production team regularly encountered roadblocks that diverted attention away from design to ensure the game properly ran on PlayStation hardware. These technical woes, coupled with Hayes Engine's baked-in issues, led to what Steve Ellis described as several months of grueling crunch, including 16-hour workdays and weekend shifts, all in an effort to hit Ubisoft's demanding milestones. Such conditions persisted in spite of the title receiving two delays after the PS3 exclusivity announcement. It's no wonder, then, that Free Radical developers had so much pride in the final product, even though, as David Doak said, staff members were well aware of the problems ahead of Hayes's May 2008 launch. Still, Free Radical expressed surprise at the poor-to-mixed critical reception. Writer Rob Yescom likened Hayes to GoldenEye 007, the now fondly remembered shooter that originally garnered a 4 out of 10, yet went on to become a cult classic. Carl Hilton later lamented how Hayes' quality elements didn't receive enough attention. Hilton and Ellis both believed the lower ratings were especially unfair, citing Free Radical's reputation of well-received experiences as reason for the unusually high expectations. Ellis went a step further insisting the FPS title earned lower scores than it objectively deserved as a penalty for disappointing the press. That disappointment presented itself in the criticism leveled against Hayes' inferior graphical fidelity, uninventive gameplay, and the poorly implemented Nectar mechanic. Some reviews advised readers against purchasing Hayes over the likes of Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare or Resistance 2, the latter of which wouldn't hit PS3 until several months after Hayes' release. Other reviewers flat out called the project disappointing, reminiscing on Free Radical's pedigree and the game's impressive public showings. At the very least, the narrative received a fair bit of praise, with the anti-military angle providing a welcome change of pace compared to other military shooters on the market. The few positive reviews did little to move the needle in Hayes' favor, and its transition to a permanent PS3 exclusive meant the sci-fi shooter never had a chance at a redemption arc. Sadly, the same fate befell Free Radical itself though not solely at the fault of Hayes, as many have grown to believe. Before entering bankruptcy administration in December 2008, prematurely dissolved deals with LucasArts and Activision severely damaged the independent company's outlook. While Crytek acquired and rebranded the group as Crytek UK in 2009, the spirit of Free Radical only lasted five more years, since Crytek shuttered the UK arm after suffering financial struggles of its own. 
The tragedy of Hayes and the tragedy of free radical design thus go hand in hand. Both fell victim to the industry's growth, its greed, a greed that preyed on smaller developers and worked for higher studios who needed their independence to survive, yet had no way of maintaining it. Fortunately, Free Radical has risen from the ashes once again, thanks to original founders Steve Ellis and David Doak reforming the studio under Deep Silver's ownership. Barring potential rights issues, Hayes could similarly gain a new lease on life one day, but its flawed debut may very well keep the once promising property shelved for a long time to come. <laughs> Thank you for watching. We'd like to take this time to thank, by name, the generous patrons who have pledged to our Hall of Fame rewards here. Maktoum Saeed Al Maktoum, Paul Cousino, and those currently subscribed to our producer rewards here. Dari Rap Sikurtson, EmuMovies.com, Lame Game Man, Milkshake, Schizo Lingo. If you enjoy our content, please consider subscribing to our channel and backing us on Patreon.